Today we're going to talk about historic bridges, a subject that's been near and dear to my heart for most of my career here at the NBT, and I'm glad that there's some bridge folks out here today, too. So if I make a mistake, you'll be sure to let me know, right, Louise? All right. Okay. I, gotta, I always start with this slide. Um, everybody knows the Craig Bridge was moved here, I don't know how long ago it was. Now, quite a while ago, because my daughter is a lot taller now than she was. <laughs> but um, when they were moving it, bless her little heart, she says, I want to go see the bridge. So it wasn't real hard to find, because you could see it from a long ways off, and there was crowds of people heading out that way. And, and so we went down there, and she says, Daddy, I want to touch the bridge. I thought, now this girl does have my genetic <laughs> because I always do that when I do a bridge survey. I always make sure I touch the bridge while I'm there. And so sure enough, we went there, and she touched the bridge, and she was kind of scared of it, and, and, uh, and then we moved on. So um, she did a little bit better my wife. I take my wife to go look at these things, and she just gets mad. So at least one of my daughters likes looking at old bridges, so that's, that's a good thing. All right. Um, bridge building in Montana really starts with John Mullen. As you all know from the very first time I was up here, John Mullen is the father of road building here in Montana. He surveyed and oversaw the construction of the first surveyed road in Montana, or even before it was a territory in, in 1860. He had to build a lot of bridges, especially along the St. Regis River in, in western Montana. And he, crossed the river at least 47 times with these simple little bridges like this. And this is the only image I've got of what they, they probably look like. It's probably not one of Mullen's original bridges, <laughs> but it looks similar to this. And uh, he was building very quickly, as you well remember, because he had a deadline to make. And uh, so he built these things. And during the winter of 1860, 1861, they all washed out all 47 bridges. And so they continuously had to keep going back to replace these things every spring. And that's one of the reasons why the Mullen Road west of Missoula never really took off like it was supposed to. It's because of the problem with, with uh, keeping the bridges maintained. But just like a lot of bridge builders in Montana, up until the early part of the 20th century, he relied on local materials to build his bridges. And again, here is all wood because he's in the best part of the state to do that. Um, Mullen also built a fairly substantial bridge across the Blackfoot River, just about where our bridge is today on Highway Two or Highway Two Hundred at, at Bonner. Um, probably, you know, not exactly the same spot, but, but probably pretty close. And he does leave a fairly good description in his report to Congress about how the thing was built. And this is what the bridge looked like. This is the earliest representation we have of what a bridge in Montana looked like. Uh, appeared in his um, 1862 report to Congress. And all he did essentially was build log crypts. And he would put those on the ice. They built this thing in the winter of 1862. And they just kept filling that thing with rocks. And then as it got down deeper and deeper, they just added more layers on top of the cribs until they had something that was reasonably level, and then they put a deck on top of it. And uh, that thing functioned for maybe two or three years. And then there's a nice little description of it in 1866 where high water had warped the bridge, and it was no longer safe to use, and they had to resort to a ferry again before they built another one. What I think is interesting about this, though, is that how many bridges have been about at that location over the last 150 years? You've got the current one, you know, the one we just, we just built this, the current one to replace another one, and then the old steel truss bridge is still there, and then this one, actually the steel truss that's there now was the third bridge at that site. And so it's just kind of an important spot for building bridges here in, in Montana. Whoops, wrong way. It's taking me to, up. Oh, there we go. Uh, now I'm going the wrong way again. There we go. Nope, wrong way. We'll get it. Um, bridge building in Montana, though, really took off after 1864. 
And that year is when Montana Territory was formed, and I hope you're all going to take advantage of the 150th anniversary of, of Montana next year, also the 150th anniversary of Helena next year. And um, one thing that the, the territorial legislature didn't have was the money to build bridges and build roads. I mean, there was no way to really tax people to do that, and so instead they relied on, on toll roads. They chartered companies to go out and build roads and bridges throughout Montana. They told them how much money they could charge. And um, part of the, the legislation that, that created the toll companies also said that basically you have to keep these things in good shape or you're going to lose your, lose your license. Now, that was a good incentive to build these, a good incentive for these things because it was a real lucrative job, uh, uh, position having a toll bridge or a toll road. I mean, you could, there was a lot of people moving around Montana. The rates that they charged were fairly high. And um, so if you had a franchise to run one of these things, you could make a lot of money. You wouldn't even need to pan for gold. You could just make money sitting in your toll gate all day and, and collecting money from, from, uh, pass or from wagons that are using these roads. Um, this is, again, one of the earliest photographs we've got of a bridge in Montana. This was taken by a man named E.H. Train, who was based here in Helena. This one, I think, was probably taken about 1866, and it's of the prickly pear wagon road. It went through what I like to rather, would rather call it prickly pear canyon, but what we mostly call it Wolf Creek Canyon today. This was at the southern end of the canyon. If you look up, on the edge of the cliffs as you're driving through the south end of the canyon. You can kind of tell about where this bridge is located because it hasn't changed that much up there. Um, these guys that operate, a guy named Warren Gillette and Mike King, made a bundle of money on this particular road. And they did maintain it very well. Um, they supposedly invested $40,000 in improvements on it in 1866, and they made all that money back in two years. So $40,000 in 1860s Montana is a tremendous amount of money. Now, I always like this photograph because this is something I always kind of think about doing, and that is just kind of taking a break on a bridge and fishing, but usually I have a state car and I can't do that because I would get in trouble. Okay, just got to get that. Um, a lot of toll bridges, a lot of toll ferries. Um, probably the most famous of all the toll bridges in territorial Montana was this one. This is Parsons Bridge. It was built in 1865, I believe. It started out as a toll rope ferry. You can see the rope for the ferry down there in the lower part of the photograph. And uh, it was located on a shortcut on the road between Virginia City and Helena. So the guy that built this, a guy named Nelson Parson, had no franchise from the legislature to build this and operate this bridge. But he put it in a good spot because it was on a shortcut and pretty soon everybody was using Parsons Bridge and they had pretty much stopped using the bypass or the, uh, the regular route. Um, Parson was a farmer by trade. He built this and then he left the operation of the, uh, the toll bridge up to his daughters and, and wife. He had six daughters and, and was married. And um, this seems to be kind of a pattern in Montana as well, that the person who actually has the toll franchise doesn't actually operate it. He usually lets his daughters or his wife do it. So I guess it's a lot harder to refuse, you know, a bunch of pretty girls and his wife than, than it is him. I don't know. But they also built these little buildings on the south end of the bridge. There was a hotel in there, a restaurant, and a saloon. And um, some of those buildings are still there. There's still a bridge at Parsons Bridge site, and Steve, you might remember when we replaced this thing, it was in the early 60s, I think, with the bridge that was there now. And so there is a little community at the south end of that bridge that originated in the 1860s with this particular toll bridge. Another one was Scanlon's Bridge. Um, Scanlon Bridge was located where Montana Highway 84 crosses the Madison River west of um, Bozeman. So if you're going to Norris Hot Springs from Bozeman and you go over the new bridge and you look off to the right a little bit downstream, you'll see some piles of rocks in the middle of the river, and that's all that's left of Scanlon's Toll Bridge. 
And uh, that's, again, one of the few spots in Montana where we still have a record of where that bridge was located, that you could obviously see pretty obviously uh, where, where it was at. Um, this bridge was in operation up until the 1890s, and it was replaced by a steel bridge. If you continue on down Highway 84, like you're going to Norris, you'll see a big bridge pier in the middle of the river, and that's the, uh, the bridge that replaced this one in the 1890s. Uh, most of the bridges, though, look kind of decrepit after a while. I mean, there was some incentive to, um, to keep them up, but in 1872, the legislature said, we're not going to deal with toll bridges anymore. So if you've got one, you know, you're, you're consider your contract canceled, and the counties are going to take it over, and the counties are going to be responsible for maintaining it. And so that's really when Montana's highways was made, were made public was in 1872. And a lot of the reason that happened was because the, uh, the, uh, the legislature was tired of dealing with complaints from people about the condition of these roads and bridges. Um, another part of it was they actually instituted some way to uh, tax property so they could make money to, um, to uh, improve the road system as well. One of my favorites, though, take a good look at this one. This is this is Brown's Bridge, original Brown's Bridge, built in 1865. Uh, it was on a short little um, toll road between Bannock and the main road up to uh, Deer Lodge. And it was on a shortcut again, and this one was in operation all the way up until 1915. And this is what it looked like just before they finally knocked it down. So can you imagine somebody driving a car over that? And they did, and I've seen a good photograph of this taken of a car, a Model T sitting on it. It was mostly on that span on the, uh, the left side, and you could see that thing kind of tilting towards the river. And uh, so when the highway department um, created its um, bridge bureau in 1915, this replacement of this bridge is one of its priorities. So but this is a pretty typical toll bridge. I mean, I'm not sure if the trusses even really function any structural capacity or not, whether they're just there to, to make the, the users feel a little bit safer. But um, I think that was the only one I had of it. So but it, it disappeared in 1915, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But it's really in 1888 that bridge building in Montana and it really takes a big form. Anybody have any reason why in the 1880s bridge building would really become important? Mark Jacobson was here. He could tell us all. The railroads. The railroads, exactly. The railroads allowed the importation of steel so that they could build steel bridges. Before that, it was too expensive and it was too hard to bring steel out to Montana to build, build bridges. It's also during the 1870s and 1880s when the railroads are really expanding in the United States, the bridge technology really um, takes off and really makes some, some significant strides. And so this is the first, the first steel bridge built in Montana. Everybody, anybody, well, you can probably tell where it's at. It's at Fort Benton. How many have seen the bridge? It's still there. It's probably the most historic bridge in Montana at this point. Um, it was built originally in 1888 with a swing span because the river was considered navigable up to that point. So the federal government made them do that. Um, they brought the steel in on the Montana Central Railroad not the Montana Central, on the Manitoba Railroad, which became the Great Northern. And it was all built through private donations. Businessmen in Fort Benton just went around to all the people they could find, and they collected money from them to build this bridge. And the reason they built the bridge was so they could have access to the Judith Basin on the other side of the river. So it was very important to the, uh, the new economy in Fort Benton, because steamboating had pretty much ended, that they get tap into that lucrative market in cattle empire in, in, uh, in, in the Judith Basin. So that's why they were able to collect enough money to build this very substantial bridge for its time. It's a Baltimore Truss um, bridge originally. Um, two of the trusses are still Baltimore Trusses, and I think they're the only two Baltimore Trusses in Montana. Uh, the swing span was a little bit different. The story goes that that thing was so well balanced that when they were finishing up construction of the bridge, that the bridge engineer was standing on the shore and he could push that thing open with his hands. 
And there was the guys that were painting the bridge were hanging off the sides of the truss while he was pushing it to make sure it worked. So I can imagine trying to paint a bridge while you're going around in a circle and you'll kind of get an idea of what it was like. Um, not too much, too sure how often it was it was used. Again, steamboating had pretty much ended by 1888. But in 1908, a company down in St. Louis sent a little packet steamer up the river is to kind of celebrate the history of steamboating on the on the Missouri, and also to bring some some agricultural goods back down river. And this is that little packet called the OK that showed up in I believe it was um, June of 1908, and it steamed around quite a bit, and it was made for quite a bit of a show for the people in Fort Benton. And then they opened up the swing span for it, and then believe it or not. Shortly after this photograph was taken, this is a colorized version of a, of a, of a different photograph, that um, a cross current in the river caught the steamboat and pushed it into the swing span and tore off most of the upper works of the steamboat. Um, just right after this photograph was taken. And so this OK turned around and went back down river. And then a few months later, there was a big um, flood on the Missouri and it wiped out that, that swing span. And there's, again, a great description of how it collapsed under a shower of sparks and the, and the noise that it made. And, and so Fort Benton was left without a bridge for a short time. They built a wooden truss to take the place of the swing span. And then when the 15th Street Bridge, original 15th Street Bridge in Great Falls was replaced, they used one of the spans from that bridge to, uh, to put that connection back into the, into the shore. And that's the one that's there now. And it's the one that's closest to, uh, to Fort Benton. It's a great bridge. You can get a chance to go out and walk on it. And, um, it does have an awful lot of history, that, that particular bridge. But most of the time, after the railroads came and steel bridge building became prevalent in Montana, that this is the kind of bridge that you got. These little Pratt through trusses. They're very basic through truss bridges. They're connected with pins instead of rivets. So it makes it very easy for them to, uh, to manufacture them back east. Um, put them together in the factories, make sure everything fits the specifications that they're, they're supposed to have, take them apart again, put them on railroad cars, and ship them off to Montana where they'd be reassembled. It's kind of like an erector set or a tinker toy set. And so because of that, it made it really easy for the counties to afford to have bridges built because they became fairly inexpensive for the counties to, uh, to, to finance. Um, still, for the bigger ones, they had to get bonds to, uh, to do that. Um, but what I've found throughout the years is that I've never seen a bond election for a bridge ever go down in flames with any county. But everybody realized how important having a good bridge was to the community's welfare. And so you never saw those kind of bridge, those kind of bond elections fail, not like school elections we have today. Um, what happened was there's a system about how these things are built. The, uh, there usually was a petition by local people to, uh, to have a bridge built. The county commissioners would accept that or they would deny it uh, if they accepted it. The county commissioners knew from the county surveyors about what kind of a bridge they wanted. And so they would specifically state in the, in the advertisement for bids that this is what we want. We want a 90-foot bridge steel and wood construction, you know, whatever type. And so it would be up to the bridge companies, which were very numerous at that time, to come up with the design. And so they would present those designs to the county commissioners. The county commissioners would select one, and then that's what would get built. Um, it was also a little illegal. You know, somebody had asked me one time about corruption. Um, it's kind of corrupt the way that it was done, because if you look in the bridge records in the county commissioner minutes that you'll notice in certain parts of Montana that specific bridge companies were always getting the bridge contract. So if you were down in the, uh, the Yellowstone Valley or up around Lewistown, the security bridge company got all the bridge contracts. If you were in western Montana or on Missoula, if you were up along the High Line, there was a bridge company out of Missoula uh, run by a guy by the last name of Papard. And he got all the contracts in those areas. In the Helen area, it was all the King Bridge Company. They call that bridge pooling. And it's illegal as hell. I mean, you, can't, you couldn't do that for the railroads, and that's what was going on with the railroads at the time. And you sure couldn't do it with bridge building. But bridge companies 
it was a really cutthroat business. Yeah, it was a very limited market and there was a lot of companies. And so what they did was they resorted to a gentleman's agreement. And I kind of have a hard time believing it was a gentleman's agreement. It says, well, security, you're going to get all the contracts here. Um, Papard, you'll get them all over here. That way you're guaranteeing uh, some business for each company. But there's always going to be some bridge companies that find themselves iced out of the process. But that also doesn't mean that they're not going to keep bidding on them. But it just becomes very interesting that that repetition that you almost know every time in Yellowstone County, Custer County, that it's going to be a security bridge, company bridge that's going to be built there. It's just, it's a given. If you saw anything different from that, then um, that would be truly very, very unusual. Um, I also like to include this photograph because of what's on the bridge. Yeah. It's a horse and buggy. These things were designed for horse travel, for wagon traffic. And we've got a lot of bridges that date to the time of this one that are carrying automobile traffic. So I think that's a real testament to the designers of these things, that these bridges that were supposed to last 40 or 50 years, some of them are still being used after 100 years. And look at the kind of traffic they're carrying now compared to what they were designed to carry. So whenever I hear someone complaining about us designing the superhighway, I always think of bridges. It was kind of a good thing that we designed super bridges. In, uh, or they designed super bridges in the 19th century, or else we'd be in a lot of trouble, I think, now. Another example of a pin-connected Pratt truss, whenever you see a Pratt truss, they've got in the center panels, they've got usually a, a cross of the eye bars to kind of set that off so you can tell. And also you can tell when you look at the bridge connections that you can actually see the, the pins up there. Another example, this isn't a, a Pratt truss. I believe this might be a Pennsylvania or a Parker truss. I'm not sure which. Up across the Milk River on the High Line, uh, mostly for wider bridge crossings, they didn't use Pratt trusses. They used Parker or Pennsylvania, or Pennsylvania trusses like this one. Um, another example of one up on the Milk River. I don't know which one this is. Um, I think it might be uh, long gone, but um, just to kind of See, you know, they really advertise these things through, through postcards in the 19th and early 20th centuries as well. My favorite bridge, or one of my favorites, is no longer exists. This is the old steel bridge up at Kalispell. Anybody familiar with this one before it went away? This one was built in 1894 by uh, the, the Herzog Bridge Company. I can't remember the first part of it. But... Um, this bridge had a pretty significant impact on northwestern Montana. Before this bridge was built, Kalispell relied on a system of ferries, river ferries, around the, the community so that people could get their, their goods in the market and shipped off on the railroad in Kalispell. But once this bridge was built, it kind of sparked a, a boom in bridge building in, um, in the Kalispell area. And it all happened because of uh, this particular structure, the old steel bridge. And this one was here up until not that long ago. I mean, it was just been a few years since this one was replaced. This bridge truly frightened me when I drove across it because you could feel it moving, and it rattled a lot. And even though they had signs that said one car at a time on the bridge, no one was paying any attention to that. And when you're sitting on the deck looking down, it seems like it's a long ways, right? So um, one of your uh, former bridge engineers, I don't know if I should mention Nigel's name. <laughs> Said he was actually wouldn't drive across this bridge. I thought, well, thanks for telling me after I'd been up there. But uh, this one was one of my favorites. I love this photograph. And uh, unfortunately, it's I think two of the spans still exist somewhere, but the main span has, has been scrapped. But getting a new bridge was really a big deal. You know, a new bridge or a good bridge could make or break a community, just as much as having a good highway or having the railroad there, because you need that bridge so you can get homesteaders and farmers and, and ranchers and whatever across the river so they could trade in your community. This is the Forsyth Bridge. It was built in 1905. And as you can see, it was a big deal in Forsyth when this thing was open. It was cause for a community celebration. And that's another thing that I've seen time after time after time is these bridges being completed and there being some kind of a celebration to dedicate the bridge. And uh, 
So this one is still there as well. The, the two spans on the on the left are still there. Um, they're still sitting in the Yellowstone River. The main span here on the right has been removed, and there's a, a levee there now so that um, you can't get up to the bridge anymore. But just again, just to kind of give you a sense of, of how important having a, a new bridge could be to a community, in some place like Forsyth, because this really opened up Forsyth to all those um, farmers and ranchers on the north side of the Yellowstone River. One of my favorite bridges, anybody know which one this is? Dave, I bet you do. High Bridge. Yep, this is the Dearborn River High Bridge. It was built in 1897, and it was built mainly to get cattle across the Dearborn River down to the, uh, the railroad station at Wolf Creek. It's got a very unique design. It's what they call a, a pin-connected uh, Pratt half-deck truss bridge. And as far as I know, and I did quite a bit of research on this about 10 years ago, this is the only one of its kind left in the United States. It's still there. Uh, we recently restored it, and the Bridge Bureau is really to be commended for, for that. And it uh, looks just like it did when it was built in 1897, pretty much. And also, it's going to last probably another 7,500 years in the process. So this is a good example of a bridge restoration that went well. And um, I think it was really a credit to the department and to Lewis and Clark County for, um, for promoting that. Here's a copy of what the plans look like. Uh, I haven't been up there recently. I need to get up there to take some photographs of what it looks like today. Um, Craig Bridge. That's kind of been a sore point with me, if you could, couldn't tell when you first got here. Um, this photograph was, of it was taken by my grandmother in 1925. And uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of historic photos of the bridge, which kind of surprises me. But um, it was built in 19, between 1904 and 1906. Um, the county had $10,000 to build the Craig Bridge. And all, the, all the, uh, the bids on it were consistently coming in higher than $10,000, except for one company, the Elkhart Bridge Company out of Indiana, bid $9,999. <laughs> and they got the contract. It took them so long to build the bridge because during the process of building the, uh, the abutments and uh, putting in the piers, they discovered that Elkhart had scrimped on the concrete and they were putting in substandard concrete and the county made them tear out what they built and start all over again. So and this, is, this is the Craig Bridge, 1925. This is the Craig Bridge today. I think and this may be something we could discuss if you want at some point. This is a good example of a bridge adoption gone wrong. Um, it was the intent of the people who adopted the structure to use it to cross Ten Mile Creek in this area, and somehow I don't think this bridge is ever going to move from that spot. I think it's going to be there for a long time yet. And, um, part of the deal with the Adopt-A-Bridge program is that you have to use the structure again because that's, you know, that's part of the federal regulations as well. And this one, you know, just kind of fallen short of what our expectations were. All it is essentially is just become a storage spot for this, this wonderful old bridge. I hope at some point somebody can find some use for it. One thing that's great about being in my position a lot of the times is people send you old photographs of bridges. So I thought, ha, so I got this one in the mail from somebody who wanted to know what bridge it was. And it looked awfully familiar to me. And so I looked it up, and I looked at a contemporary photo of the area on Google Earth, and sure enough, this is the bridge. It was built in 1910. Anybody know which one it is? It's not there anymore, unfortunately. This is the Corwin Springs Bridge down in Paradise Valley across the Yellowstone River. This was built also mostly through private subscription in 1910. It was done so that there was a connection to this Corwin Springs Hot Springs or Corwin Springs Hot Springs Resort from the Yellowstone Trail, which was on the other side of the Yellowstone River. So they put in this bridge so you could get access to that, that resort. And that's the resort there in the background. And um, this has become one of my favorite bridge photographs in the, in, since I got it. Um, they didn't build, just build truss bridges. They also built timber bridges. 
And this one, everybody recognize this one? This is the Morelli Bridge up at the top of uh, Reader's Alley. It was built in 1893. It's one of the oldest bridges in Montana. Um, it's also listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This one I've got a family connection to, and that my family was uh, quarried stone up on, on Mount Helena at the time this bridge was built, and they built the piers for the for the Morelli Bridge. So in this one, I'm going to have been over Thrill Hill onto this one. <laughs> Two of you, good. I remember the first time I went over it. I never forgot that. There's also a fairly big push in parts of Montana to build reinforced concrete bridges before the highway department was formed. This is Conley Street Bridge over in Deer Lodge. Um, one of the experimenters of concrete for bridge building were, was the old prison. And so they did have people incarcerated in the prison at the time who were good work, could work with concrete. And the, the warden at that time was a man named Frank Conley. He was very progressive as far as road and bridge building went, um, although a little regressive in other ways. But um, they had this bridge built in 1910. And uh, it still functions, one lane bridge. And there's every once in a while, there's a push by Deer Lodge to get rid of it. But uh, fortunately, that never gets very far. But at some point, I think the thing is probably going to have to be replaced. But uh, this is a good example of a convict built bridge. The other area in Montana where there was a lot of experimentation with concrete was um, in Carbon County. Carbon County had good sources of aggregate. They had good materials down there so they could make cement and make concrete. And so Carbon County also did a lot of concrete bridge construction in the early part of the 20th century. This is crosses Blue Water Creek just outside of Fromberg. Um, it's the first concrete T-beam bridge built in Montana where the T-beams were the beams were recessed under the deck. This bridge is listed in the National Register and uh, because of that structural significance of it. But uh, it's really surprising to me that the two places in Montana couldn't be more different than we're working with concrete, and that's Carbon County and, and the old prison. Also built a large number of steel stringer bridges. Now, these bridges were perfect out in the countryside. They're also perfect if it's, they also they came along at just the exact right time. This is the Locate Creek Bridge. It was built about 1903. It's in Custer County, um, about oh, 20 miles west of or east of, of um, Miles City, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, Custer County, for some reason, built a whole lot of steel stringer bridges. Well, the reason being was that this is about the time all the homesteaders are starting to flood into Montana. They needed a way to get across these streams like Locate Creek so they could get into the railroad station so they could trade their, their goods in and, and ship them off and, and you know, really help the economy of those places. And so steel stringer bridges became one way to do that. They're very cheap to build doesn't require a whole lot of engineering. And what I've also discovered is that none of them were contracted out to, um, to a bridge building country, company. It was always done through, um, through force account through the counties. So they're very hard to track down and, and get precise dates on a lot of these. I have a date of, I think, 1903 on this one, but I think it's actually a little bit later than that. And this one literally is out in the middle of nowhere. And I found, I think I told Steve this story once. I was out here, and there was um, fried, it's persilonite made out of uh, shale. Shale that's been baked by coal seam fires underground. It was just littered with that, with porcelainite along the, the banks of Locate Creek. So I just thought, well, my daughter would like a piece of that because she collects rocks. So I just picked one piece up and I just put it in my pocket and came back to Helen and took it out and looked at it and I picked up a hide scraper. And I, oh, I picked it up off of federal land too, so I just committed a felony. <laughs> so um, I thought, well, I'll be a good citizen and the next time I'm out in this direction, I'll go back and I'll put it back. And I was out there trying to find the spot and some farmer drove up and said, uh, you know, we've been seeing a lot of rattlesnakes out there. You might want to be careful. So I just threw the damn thing and got the hell out of there. Not a big fan of rattlesnakes. Um, other types of concrete bridges. Um, this was on 25th Street North in Great Falls. This one was built in 1914 by the Milwaukee Road Railroad. The Milwaukee Road was a very progressive 
railroad company as well, but they use different types of bridge materials. There aren't a whole lot of concrete arch bridges in Montana, and this is really one of the best examples of it. And uh, so if you get a chance, this is the best way to look at it because the city attached a big ugly yellow conduit to the other side of the bridge, which was actually the better, the better angle to get a photo of it. Um, how many of you know UFO history in Montana? Probably nobody, right? Um, one of the, should I tell this story, Sandy? I'm going to the story you know. Well, it's a good story. There it is, a, a, a film that was taken of a couple of alleged flying saucers flying over Great Falls in 1950, 51. And nobody's been able to positively identify what those things were in, in, the, photo, in the film. It's the first film that was ever taken of flying saucers. And if you stand here and you look at that big building behind it, you see a little water tower sticking up. In the film, those, that water tower is in the foreground and the disks fly behind it. So the film was taken by the Legion ballpark just a little bit away from the, from the granary towards the, uh, the, uh, that tower. And so I don't know if you're interested or not. I always thought it was kind of an interesting story. But that's one of the reasons they figure it's what's made it unidentifiable is because of that tower there kind of obscures the disks when they go behind it. That was kind of a waste of time, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> My wife thinks the same thing. So why do you get interested in that stuff? Um, there's a few other kind of odd bridges around Montana before the highway department was formed. This one was built about 1915. It's on the old road between um, Shonkin and Geraldine and uh, south of uh, Fort Benton across the Shonkin Creek. Um, this is called the Ratley Bridge by the locals. And I'm trying to really figure out where all the parts came from. It seems to me that some parts of this bridge may have come from a truss bridge. And then they were adapted for use at this particular spot. But I haven't been able to find any kind of confirmation that that's really the case. Um, Cora isn't here today. The Cora hit me to this bridge so I, by taking photographs of it and I went out and looked for it and promptly got lost. Um, other little bridges. This is uh, was built about 1909. It's on La Grand Cannon Boulevard here in Helena. It was built by the county. Um, some counties took a little bit more care of making their bridges look nice by putting that lattice work. Um, Guardrails on either side of the deck. This one is, is still sitting there. It's a little unsafe, a little wobbly now, the, the guardrail, but it's still there. I think it's also on public or on private property at this point. But 1915, everything changed. One thing that the new Highway Commission got really tired of was all the complaints about bridge building in Montana and also the fact that there was no standardized bridge plan that could be adapted for use throughout the county. And so in 1915, the Highway Commission, at the request of the legislature, formed the Bridge Department. So we'll be celebrating the Bridge Department Centennial here in a couple of years. We'll have to do something fun with that. And um, they stand, it was a, the first bridge engineer was a guy named Charles Kyle. He came from Utah. He was pro proficient in the use of uh, steel for bridges. And within just a few months after his arrival here in May of 1915, he was able to standardize the plans for um, steel truss, timber, uh, reinforced concrete, and steel stringer bridges. So within a short time, he was able to do that. I think he probably was borrowing designs developed by some other high, state highway department and then adapted them for use here in Montana. In um, July of 1915, they, let, or they oversaw their first contracts of bridges designed by the, uh, by the highway department. At that time, the counties were still financing them. The counties were still um, hiring the contractors, but the MBT was beginning to take more and more of a role in that whole process. And the first project they let the contract was to build a bridge across the Bitterroot at Florence. So we're in the process, I think, of building the fifth bridge across that site at this point. And you can go up there now and see where all the other bridges were located still. Um, so the bridge that's there on the left is the one that, that the MDT designed and was the first one that was built under um, standardized bridge plans. One of the ones shortly after that was Brown's Bridge. And again, it took the place of that old toll bridge that had been there since the 1860s. This is a Warren 
through truss, which was the standard highway department design bridge. Uh, it's riveted, no, no uh, pin connections. The rivets made it a lot stronger so they could carry automobile traffic and truck traffic and that type of thing. And Brown's Bridge is the oldest remaining MBT design bridge left in Montana. And it's also listed in the National Register. Um, there are some others that are close seconds to Brown's Bridge. If you go down the Muscle Shell Valley, there's a couple of bridges over the Muscle Shell that we're in the process of replacing. Damn it. Um, one at Gage and one at Absher and Miracle. Um, Warren through trusses. The ones a Warren truss and ones a riveted Pratt truss that uh, were designed by the MDT in 1915 and let the contract during the summer of, of 1915 as well. They're still there, still functioning on county roads, and um, they're in pretty good shape, but a lot of that flooding in 1911 or 2011 really undermined some of them. Here's another one of those bridges that was um, among that first group that was let to contract in 1915. Um, the Dickey Bridge down um, in the Wise River Valley. Um, this is, crosses the Big Hole River. This bridge was bypassed in the early 1960s, and uh, a new bridge was constructed further downstream. And um, so this one was kind of cut off at both ends by private land. And uh, one of the spans, you can kind of see it there on the end, be on the right side, had fallen into the river, and Beaverhead and Silverbolt counties asked that we replace this bridge. Remember this one, Dave? And uh, so I went down to look at it. I trespassed on private land. But a guy lived in New York, so I didn't care too much. And I uh, went and looked at it. And man, this was a pretty good little Warren through truss. I mean, it hadn't been used in, in almost 50 years. And so I wouldn't walk out in the deck because there wasn't much of a deck left on it. But it had the nameplate on it still. It had the original guardrails that led up to it, the distillery, the wooden guardrails. It was really in pretty good shape. And that was mostly because no one had used it for almost 50 years, it had just been sitting there. Like, uh, and then I think we replaced it. We took it out here just a few years ago because it had become dangerous, I think. So there are a few of these things still around. Natural Pier Bridge over by Alberton in western Montana, if you get a chance to go take a look at this one. This is also another good example of um, bridge restoration on the part of the MDT that uh, they replaced that uh, concrete pier there in the middle of the river, sitting on the rock, and they rebuilt the trusses, and now it still you know, functions for traffic even today after uh, almost 100 years. This one was built in 1917. Uh, there was a wooden truss bridge there before that also used that, that rock in the river as a, as a support for the spans. A lot of concrete bridges out in the middle of nowhere. This one up on Willow Creek, north of uh, Lewistown, on the old highway. This one, I always like this photo because um, a lot of these bridge engineers at the time, the ones that were um, under the employ of the state, would take their families out to these places while these projects were going on. And in some of these places, they were really out in the middle of nowhere. So this one is, I believe, the resident engineer's uh, wife and kids at the, at the new bridge over, over Willow Creek. I don't know if this one's still there or not. 10th Street Bridge, this was designed by an architect named George Shanley, and this one and another one over at 2nd Avenue, North, I think, uh, were both um, architect design, multi-arched uh, bridges. Um, this one, as you probably well know, is still there. It's been undergoing restoration for what now? I don't know how many years. Still, you know, half of it looks good and half of it looks bad. But uh, the people up there in Great Falls are still pretty optimistic they'll get it, get it done. Um, we didn't build a whole lot of arch bridges like this because they were hard to build. And there really wasn't anybody real proficient in building concrete forms for these. And so they started having problems with this one almost um, before it was even completed. And as far as the concrete starting to rot and, and things not working the way that they were supposed to, um, I'll get to that here again in a second. This is uh, the bridge at Bonner. Uh, crosses the, uh, the Blackfoot River pretty close to where Mullins Bridge is at. This one was built in 1921. This is one of our bigger bridge projects in the 20s. It was on the old Yellowstone Trail that became US Highway 10. 
the upper photo as well, it was under construction and the lower one here before they uh, made it into a one-span bridge. Took one of the one of the spans and rebuilt the, uh, the second one and now it's a pedestrian bridge. Scenic bridge up in uh, Mineral County. Some of you may, anybody know where this one's at? You can see it from the interstate if you look fast. Um, it's between Alberton and or Sear and um, Superior. It's close to the Fish Creek exit, and this one was built in 1925, I believe. And there was a big celebration again when it was opened, and this one was specifically promoted as a scenic bridge, where you encourage people to get stop their cars on and get out and take photos from the bridge. So, and it's still there, and now I believe it belongs to Mineral County. Here's what it looks like today with the interstate bridge behind it and the railroad bridge up above it. That interstate bridge is pretty impressive too, I think. Um, also built quite a bit of uh, steel stringer bridges with concrete railings. If you see a bridge with concrete railings like this, or what I'm going to show you here in a minute, you could almost guarantee they were built before World War II. Because after World War II, they started building different, using a different type of uh, bridge railing. This was across uh, Immigrant Creek um, in the Paradise Valley, the site of an old placer mine from the 1860s. Wolf Point Bridge, another kind of a sore point with the MDT, which we won't get into too much unless you want to. Uh, this one was built in 1930. It was the first bridge constructed across the river between Williston, North Dakota, and uh, Fort Benton. So there was a good 200, you know, more than 250 miles where there was no bridge crossing. And this one, was, when it was completed, had the longest through truss span in Montana. It's over a 1,000 feet long. Um, when we built the new bridge next to it. The whole idea was to drop the old one in the river. And some local folks came out, or came out and said, no, we want to save our old bridge. So we gave it to them. They transferred ownership over to the Montana Historical Society. And now they're the owners of the Wolf Point Bridge. And I bet at least once a year I see the director of the Historical Society says, what the hell am I going to do with this bridge? I says, I don't know. It's not ours anymore. You'll have to figure it out. So, um, This is the bridge design department in, uh, in the mid-1930s. So they're going to be responsible for a lot of the bridge designs from here on out. Uh, the man sitting in the middle is John Morrison Sr. He was the chief bridge designer for a long time in the 30s up until uh, I believe the late 40s when he struck out on his own to form his own engineering consulting firm with Joe Meyerly who's standing in the back row over there somewhere. The, uh, the guy with the mustache sitting next to him was the head of the bridge department, a guy named Benjamin Ornburn. And before um, Mr. Morrison died, I got a chance to talk to him, and he had nothing but good things to say about Mr. Ornburn, especially about how well he was dressed all the time. If you'll notice, he's wearing spats, which you don't see very often. But also that he was a tough guy to work for. He was very demanding, and but he very was very supportive of his of his, his bridge crew. The man sitting on the other side of um, John Morrison was a man named Gary Mon. And Barry wrote an article in 1938 about the philosophy of the bridge department at the MDT, about how they designed bridges and how they tried to design them to make them look nice. They would fit into the into the areas where they were constructed, and um, but still be very utilitarian. And so, thanks to Mr. Mon, I got a pretty good grip on our uh, grasp of what the MDT was doing in the 1930s as far as bridge construction and design went. Hardy Bridge, built in 1931 on the, the brand new road between Great Falls and, and Helena uh, across the Missouri River, which is also still there and is listed in the National Register now. This is while it was under construction. Um, Culbertson Bridge was built a few years after Wolf Point, um, just downstream of the Wolf Point Bridge, also a very similar design to Wolf Point and also quite a big um, political um, movement to get this bridge constructed during the Depression because it put people to work who were unemployed in that part of the, of the, of the state. Um, bridge over the Big Hole River, or Bighorn River, between um, Billings and, and Hysham 
can still see this one as well from the interstate. It's kind of covered by trees now, but you can get a good view of it. This one I like because when it was constructed, the company that bid on it didn't have enough money or experience to finish the project. So they walked away from it. And during the 1930s, I thought that that would happen a lot more often, where companies proved that they really couldn't do the work, so they just walked away from the projects. Well, this was the only case where that happened. That it was a North Dakota company, they couldn't finish it, and so it was up to the MDT to finish construction of this bridge, which was on US Highway 10 and is, is still there today. Uh, lots of railroad overpasses built during the 30s. This one is between Garrison and Avon. It's on a bypass segment of US 10 South that um, you can still see it off to the uh, off to the left as your right as you're heading to Helena from uh, Missoula. Um, this one's a steel stringer bridge. Very interesting in the construction file that the contractor was very messy and he kept dropping crap onto the railroad tracks. And the railroad was getting kind of upset about it. And so um, there was a lot of complaints from the Northern Pacific about all the junk that was they were finding on the tracks and how slow they had to go through this area because they, they couldn't be sure there wasn't going to be something down there. So I like this photograph. It's under construction. And of course, there's a big beam laying on the tracks down there. So it seems like the uh, Northern Pacific was, was correct. Uh, we also built a whole lot of reinforced concrete bridges during the 1930s. Um, not, mostly in western Montana, not too many in eastern Montana. This is the Sheep Creek Bridge up in Wolf Creek Canyon. It was built in 1934, I believe. And it shows just a good basic, shows you what a good basic reinforced concrete T-beam bridge looked like in the 30s. I mean, they all had those kind of railings on them. All that basic design just adapted from site for site to site. And they're everywhere. You can still see these things throughout throughout Montana. And uh, so if you see a railing like this, you can pretty much guarantee it was built in the 1930s during the Depression. I'm trying to hurry up so I'm here. Uh, we also built almost 1,500 timber bridges during the Great Depression. Timber bridges are great, especially in eastern Montana where it's so dry. These things will last forever. And um, it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to build them, as long as you have someone there that knows how to do it, that can follow the directions. And so these are great projects on the make work projects of the 1930s. So you're trying to put as many people back to work as you possibly can because of the depression. So you can put a lot, hire a lot of guys to work on these bridges, these bridge projects. And they never just let bridges singly. You always let them in groups. So it lasted um, quite a while for um, for, put, for keeping people employed. This one crosses Cottonwood Creek south of Ismay. Um, there aren't too many timber bridges left that have these double railings anymore. During the 70s and the 80s, our maintenance guys went through and shaved off a lot of the top rails of these timber bridges so they could get wider loads across these bridges. So if you see one with the double railings like this one, it's truly a rarity anymore. And it works out pretty well for us because hardly any of them are going to be eligible for the National Register because they lost their, uh, they lost that, that structurally defining guardrails that these, these timber bridges had. Uh, a few little interesting ones. This is on uh, Main Street in Deer Lodge. That it's this concrete slab bridge that's built at quite a pretty significant skew angle. And also there where they've uh, put concrete retaining walls along Cottonwood Creek. Um, this one's coming out fairly soon, I believe. Um, also, but not a whole lot of or girder bridges during the 1930s. That this one crosses the Yellowstone north of Big Timber. Um, not not a whole lot of them. Um, really, it's during the 1950s that we started building a lot of girder bridges across big rivers. So this one is uh, kind of unusual for the 30s, but you can tell it was built in the 30s. Why? because of the guardrail. One of my favorites, the Wolf, Point, Wolf Creek Bridge across the Missouri, just northeast of Wolf Creek. This, was a, this is a continuous span, through span bridge. It's functioned essentially as one big span instead of individual spans like the, the Hardy Bridge does. Um, this was the first one when it was built in 1933. And John Morrison told me, he says, when we were building that bridge, we were up there a lot watching to see how the thing went together, see how they were doing it. 
because uh, we've never built or designed and built one of these kind of bridges before. Well, interestingly, in the, in the construction file, there's a nice little letter from William Roscoe, who was the, really the prime steel bridge contractor during the 1930s. And he wrote a letter saying, I'm having a hard time, he's addressed this to Ben Ornburn, having a hard time getting my work done because you keep sending up all these spies. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just, you know, John Morrison was saying, it was just we were curious about how the bridge was being built. We wanted to see how it went together. Uh, does anything any engineer would have done. Any, probably any historian probably would have liked to do it too. And uh, so Ben Ornburn, who was very supportive of the staff, says, writes a letter back and says, Bill, he says, we never, ever have spies on any of our projects. And I looked at that and I thought, you're lying. <laughs> so John Morrison and his, and, his, and his crew weren't the spies, but we have spies on all of our projects. The project engineers essentially are functioning as spies to make sure the contractor does what he's supposed to do and report on him if he doesn't. Am I right, Steve, or am I way off? Okay, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. So although Ornburn said we have no spies on this project, we sure as hell did have one on there. He was keeping pretty close eye on, on Roscoe. During the 30s, when you wanted to build a project for the MDT because there was federal money involved, you had to hire your crew locally. You couldn't hire out-of-state people to come in and work on, on bridge projects or road projects. They all had to come through the National Reemployment Service office in, in the local in, in Helena or wherever. And uh, you also had to fill out pretty meticulous records as to how much these guys were being paid because there was a very de definitive um, wage scale rate that they had to meet. And so you had to submit all that paperwork. You had to pay your guys in cash every week and a lot of the contractors didn't want to do that and so there's a lot of violations of those federal regulations during the 1930s and Roscoe at least at the beginning was a violator of the, of the regs as well. Um, I'll just keep going fast because Sandy's starting to pace at the back. So, all right. Uh, locate Creek Bridge or yeah, no Potter River Bridge at Locate east of, um, east of Mile City is a Pennsylvania through trust that was built in the 1930s I include this photograph because I, I kind of like this one as well. Um, another continuous span bridge built over the Bitterroot River just north of Hamilton in the mid 19 or late 1930s, early 1940s. And uh, just to show that there were some variations in that continuous span design that they, that they utilized. Um, uh, deck truss bridge. Uh, we did build a few deck trusses in the 1930s. Um, all of them, are fortunately, are gone now. Um, most spectacular one until recently was at Orange Street, Orange Street Bridge in, in Billings, or in Missoula that we replaced here maybe 10 years ago. This one is the exact same design that was used on the middle fork of the Flathead River up on Highway 2 outside of Essex. And it was built in 1937, and it won an Inst American Institute of Steel construction award for be most beautiful bridge in 1938. And this is the MDT crew that went up to accept the award. That's Bill Roscoe that's on the far left who built the bridge. Um, Joe Merrily standing next to him. And of course you recognize Ben Ornburn there in the middle. It kind of looks like he doesn't have any teeth pretty much. And then that guy leaning against the, uh, the bridge uh, end post there is D.A. McKinnon was the chief engineer in the 1930s. Uh, some guy I'd like to do a lot more research on because I think he's awfully important to the history of this department. And then, of course, John Morrison is there, the second man from the, from the right. All pretty natty dressers. So he must have been making good money in the 1930s. An awful lot of bridge uh, railroad overpasses constructed in the 30s. There was federal money set aside specifically to improve at-grade railroad crossings. Um, during that decade, and uh, this one was one of the most important. This is Moss Main overpass but outside of Laurel. It's the longest and the biggest of the uh, railroad overpasses built during the 1930s. Um, it's still there, but it's got different railings today. Um, another good example of what a railroad overpass looked like during the 30s, which I believe this one went away last year, outside of Deer Lodge. 
because there was no railroad for it to cross anymore. Um, Two Medicine Bridge, east or west of uh, west of Browning, was a pretty significant project for the MBT in the early 1940s. This one was built in 41. Um, any of you who ever saw this bridge probably realized it. it looked like it was a pretty significant project at that time. They rerouted US Highway 2 to go across this bridge. Um, it was also always kind of dangerous. There was always complaints about this bridge, especially in the, in the wintertime. So if you went off the edge, there was nowhere to go but down. And uh, so this one was also built by William Roscoe who built most of these bridges. Um, Fallon Bridge across the Yellowstone River built in 1946, which I talked about in earlier talks here, that this one was one of the few projects um, that was funded and constructed during World War II because US Highway 10 was a, a highway of strategic significance. Um, the last through truss we built over the Potter River just to the southwest of Terry on Old Highway 10 this one was completed in 1946 or 47, I don't remember which. And this was our last uh, last truss bridge that we built. And then everything changed. 1950s, we got a tremendous amount of money after the war to upgrade our, our highway system. And they dispensed with building truss bridges and instead started building girder bridges across rivers. They're a lot better. I mean, there's not the height and width restrictions on a girder bridge. And yeah, a little bit more expensive in some ways, but I think probably a lot better functionality. This is the Warden Bridge in Great Falls, which I think I talked about last time, that this really changed the, uh, the how Great Falls developed by opening up 10th Avenue South. See you, Dave. I'm almost done. And then really the last of the big bridge projects before the Interstate Highway Program, and that's Fred Robinson Bridge across the Missouri and Arthur Livingston or Lewistown, excuse me. This was uh, the end result of two generations of people in central Montana trying to get a bridge built across the Missouri River. That they uh, were isolated, they couldn't do much without, uh, they couldn't do much with the ferry system there, and so they've been really been badgering the legislature for two decades, or uh, two generations to get this thing built, and it finally came to fruition, and it was completed in 1959, and then we started really concentrated more on pre-stressed concrete bridges, which, believe it or not, some of these pre-stressed bridges are historic now. This one crosses Big Cooley Creek. Um, I believe that's Big Cooley Creek, or maybe it's a mussel shell just south of, or north of Levina, south of Levina. So now we're dealing with pre-stressed concrete, and uh, that one's presenting kind of a problem for me because they literally do all look the same. And it's really difficult at times to determine whether it's a significant bridge or not, because they're mostly not going to be significant because of their structures. They're going to be significant for other reasons. So anyway, I believe that's it. Well, this is what happens to old bridges. This is the second Parsons Bridge when it collapsed in 1962 because of ice. And uh, then it was replaced by the, uh, by the steel girder bridge that's there today. So I believe it's a steel girder bridge. So anyway, with that, I'll leave it open for any questions. Went through 60 slides pretty good. Yes, sir. Do you have any photo sequences of truck connection? Yes. Um, fortunately, I don't know if it was you, the Bridge Bureau or it was somebody else, gave me their bridge photo collection. And there are a lot of photos of truss bridges being erected in, uh, in that collection. Uh, probably the best uh, sequence was of uh, the Wolf Point Bridge, and uh, that's available at the Montana Historical Society now. They've been bugging me for years to get these things, and I've been trying not to give it to them because then I have to pay to get copies. And Lynn, you don't want me to do that. So, but that's probably the best sequence is Wolf Point Bridge, and they've got those all over at the Historical Society now. Uh, that you mentioned the Wolf Point Bridge, I thought I ought to include the fact that I had a relative who worked on the bridge and saw a man crucified there. And yes. When they celebrated the bridge, I was there opening it. Oh, you were? They put on a big display of swimming across the river. Uh huh. Man, that's something. See those people, those guys 
hanging on to their horse's tail or whatever. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of interesting. Well, so, well you know, I, there was a big push to build that bridge, too. And, yeah. uh, I think the final straw came in the winter of 1929. A couple of boys in a Model T were crossing the river across the ice after a basketball game at Wolf Point. They drove their car into a hole, and the ice had disappeared. And uh, so that really provided the impetus to build something there. But, so you saw the lady cut the ribbon and the bridge floats, and the Indians blessing the thing. Yeah, that was a big deal when that bridge opened. And some of the most poetic stuff I've seen written about any bridge in Montana was written about the Wolf Point Bridge about the time it was it was opened up. So, if you um, go to Whitehall and you take the road down to um, down to Silver Star, about I don't know how far it is south of Whitehall, you'll see a sign that says Waterloo, and you'll have a point. Go down that road, and it's right about you know quarter mile from from that sign. And uh, I've been trying. I want to get up there and take a picture of the new bridge from the vantage point of the 1866 photo. But it's again, it's private property, and so I don't not sure who owns it. But uh, yes, sir. Have you been any other notable bridge failures? Um, 1935, an oil truck hit the Laurel Bridge and knocked it off the foundation and into the river. And uh, on the south, how many of you are familiar with Laurel? See, on the south end of the, the existing bridge on Highway 3, 310, um, there's a little campground off to the, the side that that was a transient camp during the Great Depression, that people, you know, essentially they were keeping bums and hobos there. And thankfully, when that bridge got knocked into the river, a bunch of the people living in that camp built a bonfire in the middle of the highway so the people didn't drive off into the, into the river. Um, that camp became a POW camp in World War II where they kept German POWs that were harvesting beets during the war for the, for the beet harvest. Or beet farmers down there. So that one's a pretty good one. Um, nothing really spectacular um, that I can think of. A lot of little ones where somebody drove something kind of too heavy across the bridge and they went through the deck. So I always figure that had to be about the worst feeling that, uh, that you could have. Especially there was a great photo, Steve you may have seen this one too, of a grain truck that went through the deck to the high bridge up there by um, the Dearborn River High Bridge, and that's a long ways down to the river from there. So I imagine that guy was, well, I won't say anything. <laughs> so, but yeah, there, there were failures. Um, sometimes um, some farmer would be burning off his fields and it would set the timber bridge on fire. And, and I mean, those things burn pretty well because they were treated with creosote. Um, yeah, some, some uh, I'm trying to think if there's any others. Really, the Laurel Bridge seems to me to be the best, one of the more spectacular examples. It seems like there was a train derailed over there at, uh, at Drummond and hit the pier on the highway going from the West Drummond Interchange towards Phillipsburg. Oh, really? And not the span down. You know, that'd be something to see, wouldn't it? As long as there's nobody on it, yeah. the bridge when it happens. So, I always wanted to see a train derailment. <laughs> it must be the Charles, the Adams family part of me. Then. Do you know what's history about the York, the York Bridge? Uh, yeah, the York Bridge, I believe, was built in 1898. And, uh, I remember a different bridge growing up. Yeah, the original one. I remember that one, too. That one scared the hell out of me. Um, how many of you remember the original York Bridge? Catherine, I bet you remember it. And, um, I think just before they closed it, I was out at some raft race out, at, out there at Lakeside, and yeah, they found out shortly afterwards that the bridge was actually leaning. Yeah, I mean, there was traffic all backed up on that bridge. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I get, you know, I get a lot of uh, questions about that one. Do you have any photographs of the York Bridge? Um, the other one I get a lot of questions about is Snowden Bridge. Over in uh, north of Sydney, the, the vertical 
lift span bridge, railroad bridge, but it was used as a toll bridge for a while for vehicular traffic. Um, it's not one of our bridges, but uh, I get a lot of questions about that one. Um, the high bridge, I get a lot of questions about. And, uh, so, and someone's always got a question. They always want to know when a bridge was built. I'll do my best to give them the answer. Or I'll, you know, I'll be a good historian and just make things up because I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I'm just kidding. Anybody have any more questions or comments about this? Um, well, there's one, there's one more. Um, yeah, I think on the pier, on those early concrete bridges, you were telling me, say, 1915 or whatever, some uh -huh. early development of concrete. I mean, they just uh, you know, get water from the river and wheelbarrow it into the forms? Or? Pretty much, yeah. Um, you can look at those the, the concrete and some of those older ones, and the aggregate looks pretty... I mean, they're, they're coming apart. I, I don't know how many of you remember the Fromberg Bridge. That was one of the early um, um, arch bridges, concrete arch bridges in Montana. And it was, that's how they did it there. They just brought the water in locally. And, and it, was, it was falling apart pretty badly. And, you know, I think a lot of it, they just didn't understand the technology real well yet. But, you know, some of those bridges, like the Connolly Street Bridge and the Blue Water Creek Bridge, are still functioning after you know, 100 years. So. Oh, that reminded me. What happened with the 10th Street Bridge also happened with the Carter Bridge south of Livingston. That They built, built that from an adapt, adaptation of the architectural design for the 10th Street Bridge. And the same things were happening with contractor with that one. He didn't really know how to build a bridge like that. And so the concrete was failing almost as soon as he got the thing finished. He didn't know how to do the guardrails and they were starting to deteriorate. So that one was the last of the arch bridges like 10th Street that we built. And I think a lot of the reason was is because they were expensive and because the contractors had so much trouble building them. Because they're pretty intricate structures. And, uh, and so um, eventually, with the Carter Bridge, they did have to take the railings off, and uh, the rest of it's in pretty good shape. But um, but it seemed like it was the same problems from arch bridge to arch bridge with different contractors. So I think there might have been something wrong with the design. All right. Well, thank you very much.